Welcome everybody to today's episode of Live Feature Rant. Over on my screen right is Adam. He's been here, he's been coming back, and he's uh, ready for action with the uh, the Fun Spot mug. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. You've been um you've got more action going on your YouTube channel recently, haven't you? Um, I just had a video go up. I put it up what last week about uh, or maybe the week before about uh, Star Citizen. Why I think it's worth a look. Yeah. And uh, actually got a new video going up this week about the news of the Babylon Five reboot. Hmm. Neato. Neato. Yeah. yeah, I heard about that. This should be uh quite interesting. There's a yeah. lot of people I know that were like, "No, Babylon Five was way better than Star Trek, or at least as good <laughs> as." Easily, hands down, the greatest um, sci-fi show ever created. Hands down. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Um, as someone who appreciates smart storytelling, um, Babylon 5 paved the way for a whole lot of shows that came after it. It was the first time that they had ever done on um, syndicated TV, broadcast TV, um, set out from the moment they shot the pilot with the beginning, middle, and end the five-year plot to tell a story and that story is just phenomenal it touches upon a lot of great things that you know sci-fi is about stuff yeah. and uh, this show hits it on all levels um the problem is the show is not really easily available uh for like for streaming so no matter how much i want to sing the praises of the show and say go watch it you'll find very quickly it's a pain in the ass to go find and get access to unless you go out and buy the DVDs. It was also, it was from the low-res era. They haven't really upconverted it at all, have they? I 9 kicked in, and what happened was uh, the show was uh, in the early in mid-90s is when that was running. Mm -hmm. And so they were the first show to utilize uh, CG effects to pretty much pull off everything. Um, all of the space stuff was CG, and it, it's aged. You can see that. Yeah. They were good about. Um, they did shoot in a um, uh, sixteen by. They shot it wide enough that they could mat it into sixteen by nine later on down the road, which is what they eventually did. And the DVDs have those sixteen by nine letter boxed um, uh, shows. But uh, it, it's it's just it's fantastic storytelling. Phenomenal characters. Uh, characters you will generally fall in love with, and the the. It's one of the few pieces of fiction, as I have gone through life, that impacted and changed me as an adult. So, anyway, uh, we're getting a little sidetracked. Yeah, definitely. You know the news was, um, over the years, we've lost uh, some major, major uh, cast members, people who were very vital to the idea of continuing Babylon 5. And we had been teased over the years that he wanted to do a big feature film. And uh, as people passed away, it became more and more impossible to do that. So what he announced at Comic-Con was that simply they will be shooting a new B5 movie that will be a reboot because with having lost so many people, they can't continue. And it's been too long. There's a whole new generation of you nerds out there that, you know, <laughs> won't give the old show a try because it looks dated, um, who would probably love the universe if you were introduced to it right. So that's what they're going to be doing. And they did say that he's going to try and utilize as many of the existing cast members as possible, but we may see them playing different roles. So okay. that, that's really interesting. Uh, like I said, I'll do a whole video on that, and that'll be up uh, probably by the weekend. But most of you, cool, yeah. most of us, will be focused on Landmark Live and in the, um, the SOE Live. What's going on down there? So enough about me. Yeah, to introduce our guest there. Absolutely, that was uh, that was quite a bit of information there. <laughs> so. And actually, one thing before I move it over to Cody here, the thought of one of my favorite animes, uh, Cowboy Bebop, it was also made in the 90s, and I don't know if it'll ever get upconverted to uh, or remastered or anything for uh, the modern was. era. But I thought, it was, I, thought it hit. I thought Cowboy Bebop was out when we were in all Only that. the movie, I think, was done in HD. The series itself, I think, was only done in like 720p tops. But anyway, yeah, get around to it. Anyway, so Cody, guy. we uh, we've left you hanging there for a little bit. 
why don't you okay. uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what you've been up to recently and uh, what's been going on with you? And of course, you also have a YouTube channel. So uh, yep, yeah, we'll, I've been we'll um, stuff. yep, I've been watching a lot of Babylon Five. So that's what <laughs> I've been spending my time with. <laughs> now I haven't seen that show yet, and I want to see it actually because I do like sci-fi and I like those deep stories like Game of Thrones, where you know that it is like a beginning, middle, and end, and I think that's like a smart it way to do it. It's insane making a point and characters change and there's contrast and you know it's big stories and little stories and yeah it's great stuff uh, I, I liken it to I know a lot of folks revere Battlestar Galactica is a show that they like oh my god it was groundbreaking I loved it um, my biggest problem with that show is I watched it it was a very pain there were a lot of things I liked about it but it was really clear they were making that shit up as they went along and just hope that it all came together at the at the eleventh hour. And that and I know for a fact Ron Morris said, No, we were making up as we went along. I had no no long term plan. And the, and it showed. And I think it hurt that show, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's it's, why I, I just highly recommend it. I would and, say uh, like episodic shows can more get away with that sort of stuff. Something where it's just, you know, it, the beginning and the end of the episode don't matter to the beginning and the end of the next episode, like The Simpsons or something like that. But anyway, Cody, we uh, didn't mean to interrupt you there. Please go yeah. on. Go on, sir. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can check out my uh, YouTube at NanoVoxel, uh, so YouTube slash NanoVoxel. And I do a lot of uh, tutorials. Every week I put up a tutorial. And they've been getting featured on uh, Landmark Live, so that's pretty exciting. And uh, I did a, uh, a longer format than normal, which was about 10 minutes, where I showed how to build a Karen base for any kind of Karen structure. So that's if you just want to build like the, ter uh, the Karen top, and may maybe you just want like a default base, that's one thing you can do. And then I just put up another video um, recently, which had some awesome stuff. <laughs> uh, doing Karen uh, planks, I called it uh, Karen catwalks. Nice. So that was uh, that was actually like a seven minute video. It shows from beginning to end, starting from scratch, how to build a Karen catwalk. So uh, go check it out if you haven't seen it. And if anyone is wondering how to build like that kind of thing, a Karen catwalk or any kind of catwalk, uh, send them to my video. It's seven minutes long, so it's really easy to watch, and uh, it goes from beginning to end, like I said, from scratch. So. Uh, and then also you can follow me on Twitter at Nanovoxel, and you can check out my uh, blog at nanovoxel.com, and then you can follow my Twitch, uh, where I'm starting to stream uh, fairly regular, regularly, usually on Friday, and that's uh, twitch.tv uh, twitch slash Cody my net. So those are all my plugs. Uh, take it away, Nero. <laughs> Karen Top sounds like an EQ prop comedian. Yes, Johnny B complex. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Karen Top. I love it. That's well played there. So remind me, you've got the um, the the Karen bridge over the water, right? Mm-hmm. That's been yep. um, a lot of fun seeing the the different kind of moving parts. First one, it was on land, and I don't even know. Did you actually mean it to be a, a water structure initially? Uh, I mean, I kind of, I just wasn't sure, honestly, but yeah, it, I, it, originally I was thinking it could be like just a raised platform in the forest or something, but then you came by and a lot of people came by and said this, or actually, and then eventually uh, Jeff Butler on SOE Live or on the workshop show said, you know, this would be awesome if there's like a boat under here, you know, remove some area so a boat can fit. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> I'll do it. Yep. So there you go. And it worked out. I, I'm really I'm not even finished with it. It's still work in progress, but that's kind of, you know, what makes it fun. Yeah, and it's looking great. The last time I visited, it looked like it's you know really been coming along, and I I know you um, kind of had some mixed feelings about the ropes coming off of that top spar. Did you ever figure out what you were gonna do for that? No, you know I haven't. I've been busy with work, so I haven't gotten a chance to really even touch it. Gotcha. But gotcha. but I want to get back to it. I want to. You know, fit. I, I kind of want to see the next uh, workshop show to see the direction they push us in and then kind of yeah. go from there. Yeah, and I'm really interested to see what's going to happen. I know uh, I had talked to Omid about it. He said we're going to get at least one more week for the workshop process for Karen's because SOE Live has just thrown everything, you know, into the mix here. And it's it's been a little bit odd, especially not getting reviews for two weeks. Because, you know, coming back from SOE Live, if they stuck to the normal schedule... That would either be the absolute last review they would give, 
or potentially even um, the week where they say, sorry, we're not doing any reviews because, uh, you know, things are being turned in next week and we don't want to, you know, tell anybody exactly what they need to do to get their build. It's kind of a silly thing, but at the same time, you know, with the volume of builds, it is really difficult to, um, you know, sort through some of them and not just basically be giving a... Uh, uh, almost a free pass to some of the builders by just telling them what little things they need to change to be perfect. So I'm pretty sure we'll get at least one, hopefully two more weeks of actual review before they finally stop that and start the, um, you know, the actual the the kind of turning your assignments in process. Um, and uh, real quick, I just forgot that uh, I just joined uh, the Guild Colossus in Landmark, so. Classic Guild, join them if you're looking for a guild, check them out, they're awesome. A lot of great streamers are in there, a lot of great people. So really cool, Karain's in chat right now and she's just an awesome, awesome woman. So uh, check her out uh, and follow her as well. She's just a cool person in Landmark, so. Cool, and of course, yeah. Poro Sorceress. <laughs> and where's my statue? Poro Sorceress needs to give me a statue for my uh, Roman bathhouse that I'm building with Infinity of Lights, so. We need to get on that. <laughs> oh, that's the um, the the um, I know which statue. I think is it one that was yeah, specifically yeah, yeah. made the, for the it? Was torso. yeah the torso? Yeah. Yeah. No. It was. Yeah. She just had it. She dropped it on there. I'm like, oh, we need this for this build for sure because it fits. It's perfect. It does. So that is definitely bring it on. Oh, you need to drop. It. She she was like doing some voxomancy stuff. She's like playing with different things on the actual build. And then she cleared everything off, it left, and never came back. So <laughs> she needs to come back, drop that statue, because we got to have something there. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Better than Dave Georgeson's nose, which is one of her builds that I still have, <laughs> uh, or part of one of them that I still have a template for. It's great. If I take that and put it in a, um, like on a, a big rectangle and paint it red, it looks like some sort of a. Um, like a, a shepherd fairy kind of uh, obey style propaganda art painting thing. So it's put actually, a mustache under it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. That could be uh, that could be kind of fun. So that's what's been going on with us, folks. Now there's been there's this thing you see called uh, SOE Live that's um, it's going to be starting tomorrow in Las Vegas, and it's of course SOE all games. It used to be fanfare and they decided well maybe we want to be more inclusive of non you know EQ fans in case like you know Planetside 2 fans want to show up or something especially because the 2012 was when they first did the uh, the big reveal for Planetside 2 and gave us the release date so it made sense to have that be the one where they rebranded it SOE Live and it works, you know, there's also the DCUO fans that come through and some other games, uh, most of which have uh, ended at this point. Um, other than Dragon's Prophet, I'm pretty sure SOE is down to their own IPs, so um, that's another kind of interesting thing that we'll be, I guess, seeing a little bit more of this year is that it's mostly going to be kind of focused on, you know, SOE's own products, their own in-house things that they started that they own everything to and they can do whatever with so that's actually to me a really exciting thing for uh, SOE's future and not that I want Dragon's Prophet to do bad or anything like that but I guess I, I, I kind of will be a bit relieved when uh, Dragon's Prophet isn't uh, one of the games in the in the portfolio anymore or that it becomes a really awesome game and it just has massive numbers but I don't know I um, I guess uh, I always wish success to the DCUO folks. They keep on bringing out all sorts of expansions, but um, it's uh, it's something that I'm wondering if it has a limited lifespan with SOE or if it's going to have to have a giant revamp at some point. Anyway. Cast my net. <laughs> nice. My uh, yeah, <laughs> my brother's a troll. <laughs> he trolled his own son <laughs> with that one. <laughs> nah, I love Cast. I think it's a cool name. So let's um, let's kind of talk about what's going on with Landmark. We've got this link here, and I'm going to post it in chat for 
just the um, the stuff landmark specific that's been uh, posted for SOE Live. So the first thing is actually on Thursday the landmark building event. I don't know who all is going to be working on that. I'm pretty sure it's kind of open seating, first come, first serve. Which is cool, because I'm sure the people who are really looking to build are going to be there, and the people who are looking to party will be over at Blondie Sports Bar or whatever, where there's going to be a special meetup going on uh, from 9 to 11. Um, but yeah, there's that four hours of open time to use the computers for Landmark, for H1Z1, for any of the games. So that's definitely going to be uh, pretty interesting to see what people are able to whip up in four hours there. Definitely. Working on an update for something undisclosed, presumably for Landmark. Yeah, I would imagine if it's from Felgon, it's something related to Landmark. <laughs> and then Friday, Friday early, is the Landmark keynote. Now, keynotes are kind of an interesting thing. Um, the the evening, the, the big keynotes that they do, uh, I think that's going to be on Saturday. Um that's um that that's one of the meals or maybe I'm thinking confusing it with a grand banquet or something there's two major meals but then the other uh keynote sometimes they'll have some other stuff um the the first ever quest next keynote had little glasses of champagne for everybody so uh I, I grabbed a couple of those they were good <laughs> nice <laughs> and of course uh something to uh Celebrate! Everyone was supposed to be there to uh, to join in to toast the new game or whatever it was, and you know that was that was probably one of the best parts of last year. So we live was that big reveal, learning about EverQuest next and seeing it live, and then being told about this thing called Landmark that sounds really cool, but we didn't really know quite what it was then, and. I kind of had an idea of what it was, and as uh, you know, when it came along and we started getting into it, it I started kind of seeing that it's more and more uh, getting close to kind of the idea of what I had for um, you know what Landmark was when they first showed it off. So I'm really glad that I, I guess mentally that I was right that this is actually what Landmark is and it's not some other silly thing. And I'm really glad to see how Landmark has you know been coming along. We're 21 weeks into the closed beta, open beta or the uh, uh, not closed open beta. It was the um, um, the the early access uh, pre closed beta or whatever it was. Um, I guess it was early alpha. Um, I think that was only eight weeks so that was um you know a short period of time if you think about it relative to the long time we've had in the closed beta here it's it's been a hell of a closed beta but then again the amount of stuff that they put in over this time has just been fantastic and they've been learning from us the entire time it could have been a lot faster if they shut us out and didn't have us involved but then it would be a much bigger learning process to learn all the stuff that we'd be finding out and teaching them and having them change the mechanics of everything. Well, I, I'm kind of kind of have to disagree with you there because I think it kind of uh, goes both ways as far as launching a live product where uh, they ha the people working on it have that motivation to get it done because there's people literally sitting there playing the game waiting for the content. So like, <clears throat> I feel like it kind of works like in both ways in that aspect where like if you have a live product that you're doing updates to and trying to like keep up, it's gonna make your workforce, you know, work that much harder and be that much more uh, proficient. That's true. Big update coming uh, in for week after next. Cool. I'm looking forward to that. Thanks, Poro. It's probably gonna be some of the stuff that they're revealing actually making it in the game. Oh yeah, I um, you know Dave Dave Georgian had posted we're not going to have a release date for um, I, I believe he said either game and I'm not sure if he meant Landmark and EverQuest Next or EverQuest Next and H1Z1 or 
which two games because there's there's kind of three of them that people are waiting on <laughs> but um then i asked well i you know that's fine i just want to know when uh story bricks and combat are coming to the game to which he said oh yeah about that uh uh, just yeah, uh, wait on that. that. <laughs> so <laughs> that, I, those two things that are not in the blueprint and we know are going in the game, yeah. That, yeah. What about those things? <laughs> exactly. So I'm thinking there's going to be the big reveal and we'll hopefully start seeing the functionality start coming through pretty soon, which I'm really excited for. Yep. I'm, I'm excited for Story Bricks. I'm, uh, I, I think they said they're going to sh be showing a demo or some kind of demonstration. Yes. I don't know, like, if they're going to be releasing anything to us to use, or if it's just going to be kind of like, here's what we're working on. I think that's kind of the big question for me right now. They definitely said there is going to be a um, EverQuest Next specific uh, Storybricks demo, or at least that was the the branding they used when they showed it off at the um, the AI conference in Vienna that we've been referencing for the past couple of weeks here. Um, they they specifically said you know this is you know we're, we're if you want to know more about it basically watch SOE live because that's really where it's going to be executed so I'm really 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 looking forward to seeing all the details with that plus the uh, the conversations that Diggs and I had with Jeff Butler on site at the uh, block party it sounds like it's a really easy system to work with like super super easy. So uh, that that should be really really nice. Could put more adventuring stuff without necessarily combat. Yeah, that's true. I don't know that combat's a while off though. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be here soon. I think it's gonna be here soon. I think it's gonna be that's gonna be the big announcement. Uh, combat PvP because well, yeah. I mean there's they've been hyping. They've been hyping up this game. They're like, oh, you know, uh, I'm not sure who said it. I'm not sure if it was in Omid's stream or if it was in someone else's, but they specifically said there's going to be a large player influx coming very soon. And I suspect that is going to be, uh, you know, SOE Live is going to be the platform that they're going to use to announce, if not, you know, PvP now, PvP coming very soon, because that's what people want to play. Yeah, well, PvP and PvE, I mean, they're the other thing, we've still been kind of waiting on the rest of the crafting system to come through. Salvaging and the uh, the upgrades where you can add the different enchantments on it. And then altars. What happened to altars? Those were supposed to be awesome. Well, that stuff is on the blueprint, and that is that is after SOE Live. Okay. And the crafting 2.0, that's a little bit down the ways. But I, but I could see it having been pushed back a little further to actually get combat in first so that uh you know the items that we're crafting with crafting 2.0 are not just the tools but actually starting Weapons, to get into your, yeah your basically your build specific stuff yep adam you haven't said much in a little while um no, okay, okay. <laughs> um hmm so something go ahead yeah something kind of just off topic but uh on the home page of landmark they have a, a 20 dollar game card that they're selling at walmart and i'm just going to post a link mm -hmm. um but it's just kind of interesting because uh they're hyping it up uh with the 20 dollar game card you get 2000 uh station cash which is the normal mm -hmm. ratio uh but you also get some additional materials and it's like a rng pack so like you have a one in, or there's five different packs you can get, and it's you know whatever random randomly generated you get, and you get the additional materials to build and stuff. So you know it just seems kind of like why would they be uh, introducing some kind of new this new game card into Walmart unless they're planning for those players to be utilizing those cards? Yeah, you know what? That's a good point. What the heck? Because that's that's an interesting um, to do the only at Walmart with it. Uh, but that definitely is, the, it looks like the generic landmark card with the uh, Walmart sticker. It's different than the um, the ones they've had for uh, like Planet Side 2 in the past, for example. This, I believe they were available at GameStop and maybe some other places. Um, this card right here, you'll, you'll see it on the screen in a moment. And they, um, they come with the exclusive uh, Platinum Gun 
course, the first exclusive Platinum gun was the NS11P, which a couple weeks ago they just gave anyone freely. If you log in, you get this exclusive gun that everybody used to spend $15 to get. So, um, you know, it's the the idea of the extra add-ons and stuff for buying the cards. I would more likely see a uh, landmark card coming to GameStop or other places that gives you more of like the monthly items like the flight suit or the gem seeker or maybe a twenty dollar card that gives you two or three of the legacy giveaway items or something like yep. that. Yep. I'm I used to work at GameStop and they're notorious for having all the those kind of giveaways items, especially with like pre sales and stuff. Yeah. For sure. Well, that's definitely interesting. Now, there's another type of card, a very, very special one. They haven't really talked about it too much. I don't have the link handy, but I'm sure somebody could find it. For the $35 cards they're going to have on site, and those cards are going to be the same ones every attendee gets one of, which gives you all of the... SOE Live 2014 items. In the past, you would assign the game that you, you're coming for, and you would be given items based on that game. But I always thought that was kind of silly. We're you know paying for the full ticket. Why only get one item? So now they're not only making it, you know, you get thirty-five dollars of station cash, and you get all the items. And if you want to get more for your buddies, you can go to the um, uh, the store on site at SOE Live and buy more of them for $35. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's pretty good. Now, that's all the uh, landmark in game items that you would get with that? That's all of the in game items for every game. Not, Does that not, no, the not, the, uh, not the monthly items. No, okay. it's the, uh, the SOE Live exclusive items. I which I don't know what those items are for uh, landmark off the top of my head. I know there was a beanie for H1Z1, some guns and camo for Planet Side 2, which that itself is a pretty decent deal. Um, oh, Landmark's got an exclusive flag, I believe, and maybe some other exclusive prop. The uh, Founder's Pick? Would that be part of the pack? No, I don't think so. Okay. I'm pretty sure that's only uh, Founder's Packs. Wait, so you're saying they're going to get a unique flag that has yeah. like a unique icon? It's oh, got wow. like a SOE Live 2014 icon on oh, it. Oh, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, they've done that stuff in the past, um, decorative props for uh, SOE Live and such. So that's pretty cool that they're going to be doing that. So getting back to the list here of all of the events so Friday is when the actual the action starts so like I was saying landmark keynote that's gonna be from 9 to 10 in the morning I don't know if they're gonna have food you know there's just as likely a chance that there's gonna be free champagne as there is free sausages bacon eggs and uh, potatoes and all that stuff um, the landmark live quest there's a dice game involving resources so Settlers of Catanmark, I guess. I don't. Is there another resource based? Uh, I guess there are a bunch of resource based uh, board games out there, huh? That's my guess, Settlers of Catan. <laughs> I can't think of another one. I mean, Risk is kind of resource based. In a different way. It's not It's not based on like having materials and being able to use them to do things. It's. Right. Yeah, so. That should be well, pretty get the cards interesting. On the side, but yeah, <laughs> not really. Can't run Landmark and OBS at the same time. Uh, I can still play. Huh? Interesting. Uh, yeah, no, it's it it is kind of tough to stream Landmark if you're not willing to compromise the resolutions and qualities of everything. So the dice game is going to be going on Friday from noon to two. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be at some amount of H1Z1 panels and stuff going at the same time, so I don't think I'm going to be around for that. And then from 2 to 3 p.m., the Landmark Building Tools Current and Future Plans. I'm excited for that. I'm so excited for that because we've kind of had some inkling of the current and future plans, but we haven't really, you know been told like what what is there to come what what more are we going to see 
And I'm wondering, uh, Diggs and I got to see some stuff off of Jeff Butler's cell phone, some weird one-by-one-by-one oh. by one by one shape, something that looks like uh, an L-shaped block or something that looks like a um, like an inverted corner piece, something that's actually got uh, convex um, uh, shapes to them instead of being... Um, or concave shapes to them rather than being convex. Because right now I'm pretty sure... Uh, voxels normally maintain more or less a convex shape and you can't really have it like cut into itself in that at position unless you're getting into some of the really freaky stuff so uh, I'm really really excited to see what kind of stuff they're going to be showing off and uh, not sure if that one's going to be streamed not sure if I'm going to be filming that one or maybe I'll just take some pictures of some of the good stuff so really excited for that. Are there any things in particular with the building tools uh, that you guys would be looking for or interested in? Uh, I would uh, I would like to manipulate the voxels independently of each other, kind of like uh, any kind of uh, vector based uh, engine. You know, I'm used to like Illustrator, which is 2D vectors, but basically each voxel is a point that has lines connected to it. Are, are lines that are connected to other voxels, right? And those are called vectors. So yeah. it would be nice if we could free, uh, freely select an individual voxel and kind of manipulate it, you know, at, on a very micro scale to get any kind of specific shape that we want. So I think that would be really nice. Or even if we could have some kind of uh, slice ability into voxels, like a slice tool. Uh, Source uh, SDK used to have a really nice slice tool that could really make some interesting shapes very quickly and easily. Hmm. That would be pretty nice. And I'm then not... also, um, I would like some level of detail for the map view, where currently, if you're in map view, you can't see any props, you can't see any trees. So it really kind of looks barren and kind of lame on, in the, from the map view. So I'm hoping that they add those prop, uh, you know, props to the map those l low level of detail props. I'd just go for sprites at that point. Just replace the uh, the props with the representation, the the props with a representation of a sprite in those places. Well, and it would it would at least get you a lot closer without nearly as much impact. Because I guess I, I'm not sure. Because um, this is kind of getting into interesting territory, and I don't know how well um, the engine renders 2D versus 3D. It's an issue that comes up with Unity and a lot of other engines, U, UE4 and others, um, that a sprite will often be more difficult to render, especially if it's got a lot of alpha, than a polygon with a texture on it instead. Uh, there was a project I was on last year where that was actually what they had to do to improve the efficiency, is take out all of the tree sprites and then replace them with a, um, a vector... Uh, um, uh, not that, it, basically a polygon uh, version of the tree with the, the texture basically pasted on using UV and it worked better um, I'm not really sure what would be better but something something to give us more representation so when you open the map you actually see trees and you actually see you know things that that show what's going on in the area there for sure I totally agree Yep, and you know, yeah, as far as optimization is concerned, <laughs> I know the chat's talking about it. You know, that's kind of, you have to you have to make it look good or else it's not feasible. And as far as, uh, you know, using like a sprite or a 2D image to uh, mimic what it would look like, I don't think that would really work because I think the cool thing about the map in Landmark is you can get that 3D angle. That's true. Hmm be uh, interesting to see how, how they would be able to resolve that in a way that it doesn't kill performance but gives us a more kind of realistic view like you know super super low level of detail and even another lev lev uh, lower level of detail after that so where it's really just there's there's a stick and there's some green fluff over it and that represents a tree to some area that's way far out on the map but the stuff that's more kind of in focus on the map maybe slightly higher level of detail so you can see more that you know it's a tree it occupies this space relative to the claim yep 
Yeah, I think it's definitely like a mixture of art and technology that kind of, you know, figuring out the best way to do it. So definitely beyond my scope of expertise. Yeah. But in terms of um, building tools, I think one thing I'd love to have is a um, a line um, remove. Instead of being able to use the line tool to add voxels, being able to use it to remove voxels without having to create the line and then copy it and do the um, paste negative, basically. So what would be the advantage of that kind of tool? Um, basically, I'd be able to work subtractively. I could start with a large block of whatever and then use the line tool to cut little sections off of it to give it a really cool effect. So kind of like you're just trying to shave off corners yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. And I, I know it would be asking a lot, but getting some rotation features to the uh, the ends of the line tool would be fantastic. But that's... I I wouldn't even know where, where they would begin with that. The line tool is already such a finicky piece of equipment as it is. Yeah, that's a good question, Acidic. I am going to be there. Um, we have a few folks here who will be and I know a lot of people that want to be here next year <laughs> so building tools and Adam you're um, you're 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 still pretty much in the uh, the position that you're not not too much interested in the the building stuff quite yet or you are but I'm, you know I mean, you guys are hyper dissecting stuff I'm never going to give a shit about <laughs> <laughs> all right fair enough Fair enough. Okay, so that's actually a small amount on Landmark for um, Friday. EverQuest Next, though, you know, continue to refer to the link, and I'll post it again here for you folks. EverQuest Next from 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. It's another keynote. There's just going to be back-to-back -back keynotes for, for Landmark and EverQuest Next. It's going to be awesome. Uh, anybody who's going to be there, get there early. I'm sure the room's going to be packed for both sessions. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's cool. the the only reason why I don't think every single uh, EverQuest Next and Landmark session is going to be absolutely packed is because I know there's a large volume of H1Z1 fans that are going to be there and might not quite be as interested in that weird fantasy stuff. I don't know. <laughs> EverQuest is pretty big. It H1Z1 is. doesn't really have an IP yet, so no. I think but we're gonna. It's gonna be packed. The idea of all of the um, all of the people who have played all the zombie survival games that have kind of stalled out in development or have worked. They're looking weird. to reform. Yeah, yeah, it's there for sure. Yeah, so we'll definitely probably see a lot of that. But you're right. No, it. I'm sure it'll be packed. The um, the landmark stuff and the EQ next stuff because you know we've had everyone's had a year to know okay this is the SOE live I want to be at because they're doing like all sorts of uh, landmark and EverQuest next reveals and maybe something else I don't think so I'm pretty I'm pretty sure they're they're pretty much um, at the at their limits for our, the amount of projects that SOE can take on right now, so I couldn't imagine. You know, who else will be working on the other stuff? If they, you know, I don't know. You never know. It yeah. would have to be maybe if they were doing like some sort of small web-based game or uh, phone app game or something. Sure, maybe they have a like Korean that. team or something. Who knows? I don't know. I think they're they're pretty much keeping it to North America to. Uh, Mostly San Diego and that little spot in Texas. Um, so, fiction and lore for EverQuest next is going to be 3 to 4 p.m. Join our lore masters in exploring fantastic tales set within our uh, reimagined Norath. We'll answer your questions about the fiction release to date and hint at the direction of the stories to come. Pretty cool. The um, have you guys been following up on the um, the the lore books and reading all of that stuff? I no, haven't. Uh, it's on my to do list. It's also my to do list. Although you know, uh, it's just so I I need to do it because I need to get like immersed in the world, especially with the workshops and stuff, right? 
So I need to do that, and it's free, so no reason. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're pretty good. The um, I I finally um, finished the Archmage of the the Tear Doll um, one and two, and just like I've been saying the entire time with the lore books. Each book they have involving the Archmage Coral and Larkos makes me hate him more and mm. makes me happy that we'll probably get to kill him many times. And the reason why I say many times, spoiler <laughs> alert everybody, um, I had imagine the it's going to be like this ultimate raid of raids where you have to take down um, Coral and the Archlich as well as anybody else that Ithiosar has taken over at the same time that you're fighting Ithiosar himself and basically kill all of them within a day of each other otherwise they all respawn and their life force is, is continued and brought back and they just kind of go into hiding until they're strong enough again mm -hmm. I'd love to have that that would be awesome that would be like epic world versus environment sort yeah, of stuff the trifecta <laughs> to win yeah I like that because you know any any one point in the process you know it, it could be a day long battle to take some of those things down um, you know the, the they might not have high regeneration for their health but they have such a giant health bar it's just gonna take forever to get through them not really sure how it's gonna work though um, with a larger boss like a dragon I don't know if we're using war machines against it or just conventional hand weapons yeah, that's a good question. You know, no MMO really, as far as I know, uses war machines against mobs like consistently. You know, some in, uh, scenarios and instances have like things you can use that are there, but you don't really bring them with you. Yeah, pretty much. So I don't know if they would do that. It it would make sense to be able to use. Um you know those sorts of things especially if it's something that's kind of slow and kind of easy to get into a position like one of those iron golems I would imagine they're just being a um, an array of catapults si set up just kind of waiting for them and if one ever comes through at least one of those catapults will be able to uh, you know line up on it and get a hit real quickly and just get it out of the way or put a ding in it those things are probably gonna take more than one catapult to take down <laughs> those things are giant they just punch through right. a house like it's nothing yeah that was pretty epic video are we gonna see a return of the iron golem i wonder our good friend i think so brand new particle effects and renderers and all of that stuff yeah and what about the um what's the plant What's the plant called? The Chomper. The Chomper, we'll yeah. See him again. Yep, they introduced. I feel like he. I feel like he's coming back. If they give us the ability to um, put enemies on our claim in, you know, kind of an artistic way, there's definitely going to be big green uh, cylindrical tubes, tubes with, with a couple. Of, <laughs> yes, yes, piranha plants. They are piranha plants, basically. <laughs> Straight out of Mario. You know it. But that's cool. And of course, you know, we want to have our uh, Sarlacc pits from Star Wars. Of course. So we need some, you know, we need some kind of static plant mob that could go in there. Actually, it, was that how it digested things? Did it have smaller organisms to help break things down inside it or something? I... Or No, it, it was a big organism, but I guess it was, I don't know. It digested you over a thousand years, so that's all I know. <laughs> But you'd be dead in ten minutes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, definitely more golem. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm I'm looking forward to getting more golem going. That should be uh, that, and you know, we saw some kobolds and we saw some other stuff last year. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to see a lot more this year. Like uh, Jeff Butler was saying. Um, at the block party event that he can go you know, in his office, log into the build of Landmark, walk by a castle and have archers firing down from the top at him. And you know, that, that kind of indicates that yeah, combat's kind of close. It's got you know, a lot of that functionality there. So 
I'm really, really excited. We might actually be getting the release date for combat, or we might be getting the uh, the teaser for what's coming in maybe a couple of weeks, which would be really, really sweet. Yeah, I think the the big thing on everyone's mind is, uh, you know, optimization. Will that be coming uh, with combat? Will that be coming before combat? I think that's the big question on everyone's mind, and also. You know, what form will combat come in? Will it be, will combat exist in the islands that we already inhabit? Or maybe combat will only exist in new islands that maybe are smaller in scope and maybe more manageable for that kind of multiplayer uh, netcode. Mm. I am pretty sure combat is going to be in the current world that we have. Um... You know, mobs and uh, mob camps potentially they'll all be procedurally generated and procedurally built up in the world as they uh, you know, potentially congregate in areas and build them up um, potentially there'll be mobs that aren't you know they're not really rooted to anything they can go anywhere particularly through solid you know earth through solid stone um, you know earth bur burrow or worm type creatures and you know they could they could really just go crazy with it, <laughs> um, but in terms of being able to handle the netcode and being able to handle you know people being able to fight um, on claims or off of claims, I don't think they have to change anything. I'm pretty sure all of what they've been designing up to this point is so they can just come in one day, press a button, and drop the combat system on us. Well. I don't know of any system that works like that. <laughs> well, you just by, press a button and it works. By press a button, I'm talking more like it's You're, a 12 to 18 hour update that might actually yeah. take three days. <laughs> right, right, right. But uh, but yeah, I I just think like the truth. You know, the fact of the matter is, I uh, on group claims and group builds and stuff, people crash consistently, and it's just kind of the way the lay of the land as far as. The way the voxel system works, especially if you're building together and trying to occupy the same space and that kind of thing. So, like right now, you know, if you have like ten or more people uh, on a claim, you know, it's it's just not going to be very stable. Um, I think part of it is that the uh, the world server has to keep up with all the stuff. A it has to keep up with all the stuff people are doing as they're adding and building and deleting and changing the world, and B. Um, with these group builds there's a higher potential that there's just large 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 volumes of props being used and a lot of um, you know parallaxing where you're seeing you know through many 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 layers of voxels and all of that stuff also you know can really hamper optimization and um, you know your ability to, to render everything but I'm pretty sure if it's um, you know because I've I've gone uh, treasure hunting with Yumino before and had upwards of 25 people surrounding a treasure chest with zero performance issues. And, you know, all the props and stuff that are in the caves uh, around, no problem whatsoever. So, uh, I'm not really as worried about adding more players to the situation as, you know, people trying to fight around really, really dense claims or ones that are really detail heavy. Yeah, I mean, uh, I... I I just uh, I don't see PvP in this game, uh, you know, at its at its current state as far as like frames per second and stuff go, drawing that PvP crowd in, you know, like <laughs> I get a, you know I get sixty a hundred frames per second consistently in all the other games that I play, and if I only get twenty frames, you know, and that's on a good day, you know, if if there's not a lot of activity, but if we're talking about spells and uh, voxel manipulation happening on the fly and that kind of thing. You know, it's. I think it's a big concern of mine and a lot of people of how that will really run on people's computers. That's a good point. I mean, that might also be a reason why combat and even Storybricks has waited this long because it might have just required a lot of optimization. So, how how is Landmark running for everyone these days? And that's open to you folks in chat too. How well has it been running for you? But um, Adam, like, how 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 was it running the last time you were in uh, collecting and treasure hunting and all that stuff? Um, it's better than it was a month ago, but it is not where it needs to be. 
um, I'm averaging 20 to 25 frames a second, uh, generally speaking. Um, I'm still seeing drops into the teens, depending on, like, um, the Tinker's Workshop, work, the, the advanced one. <clears throat> it's constantly animating now. Yeah. And it is... Um, it's a re- like it easily eats five ten frames a second. Like it's amazing how bad it sucks out. You know, performance. So um, I've I've seen I, that. I, yeah, I would agree with Cody that the the game's performance isn't where it needs to be for combat to be as robust as it would you know need to be in order for PVPers to stick around. Um, you know what I mean. Um, yeah, you start throwing in, you know, that kind of combat, thing, information going back and forth, and yeah, and, and again, I'm running a system that, you know, is really on the high end um, with an above average but not phenomenal video card. I, I should be able to get much better than 25 frames a second out of the game moving through the world with the grapple. So they keep telling us there's a big optimization thing coming and maybe that's what, you know, some of the things we're going to see in the next couple of weeks. So um, we'll see. Yeah, that's kind of, you know, they did talk about the big optimization, but at the same time, Jeff Butler said, you know, optimization doesn't have, it's not like one thing, it happens over a period of time, it's multiple little things. So right. that's kind of, you know, I'm not really sure how they could just like, boom, it's optimized, but maybe they can. Well, I mean, no. uh, when I think of optimization, it can be anything from taking a specific public variable that everything is referencing but nothing actually uses and turning it into a private variable and anything that does need to access it, just telling it where to find it and how to reference it, that that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. Or changing, maybe you don't need uh, 32 bits to hold that set of data that every character has uh, 50 times over. Maybe you can do it with a short. Maybe you can do it with, you know, 4 bits or 8 bits. And that sort of stuff helps with optimization. There's so many things, like big and small. You know, there's probably little optimizations that come in every single week. But at the same time, you know, optimizations aren't a feature being added. That's a feature being uh, cleaned up. So just as features are being added, they're also being cleaned up. So one thing might be more optimized but then an entirely new system has been you know added or changed and all the optimization uh, lost from that has made the game seem like it's running worse Um, it'll be better when that gets fixed but then the next update and any optimization required with that so I mean that's it's a closed beta this that's kinda the stuff to expect we're not you know it's not like we're on a live server and we're you know jumping over to the test build and you know trying stuff over there we, we understand that you know yeah you know, we're, we're in closed beta you know I mean most games I've ever been involved with on the beta side have been um, um, optimization like real heavy duty oh wow there's a difference is one of the last things to happen before the game goes live at least traditionally that's what I've seen I have seen that before too, for sure, for sure. Yeah, fix your damn doors. Yeah, yeah, Zeit. See if any prop that changes its position and has like a physical boundary that moves to a different area, be it a door, pork cutlet, the uh, the new um, bookcases, the rugs. I had one of my rugs literally go about. 50 voxels up and 60 voxels over the edge of my topmost claim, but I could still manipulate it as if I owned it just fine. Mm. So, yeah, there's there's definitely some um, some oddities going on with, um, and that's always been that's that's one of those weird bugs that I think they have fixed and then have lost the fix and then have fixed and not fixed, or maybe it's just never been fixed. Yeah, it happens with your rugs. Yeah, any of any of those sorts of things it it works with. Um fortunately my um my trap doors haven't moved yet, but I'm I'm waiting for the day when I log back in and they're all uh weird. It'll happen. <laughs> It'll <Just> happen. <laughs> yeah. Don't want it to happen, but 
or maybe that's the item they got right, and they need to go back through and um, base the um, the animations and and um, positioning and stuff on those. So, uh, Ozzy Mando says you probably probably just unlocked the first flying carpet, Nero. So, yeah, probably. Congratulations. <laughs> well, I just looked at the thing happened with my uh, Portocollis. Um, the gate was all the way up towards the top of my claim. And if I clicked it, like, you know, if I grappled up to it, hung on it, and then clicked it, the door would drop normally like it's supposed to, but it was still up in the middle of the air. I just grabbed it and re-brought it back down, and now it works the way it's supposed to. So something happened, but... There's something wrong with it. Some kind yeah. of orientation. There's some kind of, like, padding or something. Something's yeah. happening. First time I've seen the, the Portocollis do it, too. Like, when it was first added to the game, it was behaving strangely for a week or two. And then it was fine for a while. And now it's being weird again. So they yeah. broke something. <laughs> yep. Which is weird. But, you know, they'll they'll eventually fix it. It's it's one of those things that it might just be on the back burner because they know they have to fix it, but they know there's so much other stuff that they want to get into. Mm -hmm. It might be something that is easy to fix, but is just going to be a very long and tedious process to do. And do we need doors? I mean, honestly, I don't feel like we do at this point, but that's just me personally. I don't feel like doors or even, I mean, I don't think the glass props are even really necessary in some, you know, very select cases, but kind of just adds uh, latency. The glass props? Yeah, I would just say, like, especially if you use a lot of them. It's, uh, I it, prefer just air. Well, I mean, it's, it's just if you want to have something that's um, closed in and encased and you don't want to have to worry about um, other voxels nearby getting disrupted with it, uh, that's... Okay. You know. I'm totally, uh, you know what, uh, chat's saying I'm totally off base. <laughs> so they want doors, but that's just me. <laughs> we need windows and doors. <laughs> Sorry, chat. <laughs> Forgive me. Of course, I'd really like to have some doors in Planet Side too. It worked uh, well for the first one. It worked so well. I loved it in the first one, but... It, now they just have the phase uh, things, right? Yeah, the the energy walls that you walk through, which they're not nearly as engaging. And honestly, that for me was the biggest thing in Planet Side One was the advanced hacking skill, because if you had to open a door, you had to hack the door, you had to hack the lock open, and it only took me a couple seconds. But it would, you know, if you didn't have any points in it, it would take five, eight, ten seconds. Also, taking over a base was a lot quicker. Um, or the the process of getting it started, so that was that's a mechanic I really really miss was using the remote electronics kit to um, uh, actually have to hack through doorways and then having um, you know a standoff at a doorway because it's just a narrow tunnel going in and they're already bunkered down there. Um, different game, different subject. So. Uh, let me, let's get back on the subject here. So the 4 to 5 p.m. Um, on Friday is going to be EverQuest Next, the tech evolution of the world. Come and find out some of the details on how we got to current technology being used in EverQuest, uh, in being used in both EverQuest Next. I think they forgot the rest of the sentence and landmark. Um, or maybe they're talking about that in H1Z1, but uh, that should be really cool. That's going to probably teach us about voxels, and hopefully it'll give us a bit of a reveal for what's going on with dynamic water and physics and other sorts of systems that I know a lot of people have been really wanting to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dynamic water is going to be really awesome. So, Oh, yeah. I'm excited to see that. And, you know, it, it kind of like... If, if they can have uh, voxel water that can move, I would imagine they would have uh, solid voxels that can move and slide down as well, which they haven't really talked about, like physics in the voxel engine. But I think that would be really awesome. Yeah, that's kind of one of the things I was disappointed with all of the, um, the moving props that we have, that none of them actually hold your position on it. They'll just slide out from under you or, you know, move and just kind of let you fall through. Uh, I 
that's why I really wanted the different types of movement patterns for the bookcases and the carpets and stuff because I wanted to be able to actually set up some sort of um, you know platformer mechanics where you have to stand on something and activate it and have the elevator move you up into the next area <laughs> you know that sort of stuff people love that sort of stuff mm-hmm. that's, you know that's great game design stuff you can you can kind of tell the story of the area by having this semi-linear you know space that they just have to kind of solve the puzzles and find their way through so that's um, that'll be something hopefully that'll be uh, something else they'll reveal with the tech is what's going to be going on with those kind of props and that kind of functionality and possibly even vehicles you know that's something wow. that you know it, I, I've seen so many games with custom build your own vehicles that I could see it even being a thing that goes into landmark well that's interesting because they were talking a lot about ships and they were talking about <laughs> building ships and you know what better thing than a voxel ship because it seems like just an easy surface or an easy like way to travel around and kind of visit and see everything so I would love to have be able to build our own voxel ships that could travel and it seems kind of like <clears throat> excuse me the new rotate tool might be a step in that direction because I think if you get so. out if you could have a voxel template that can rotate, you know, it could be a ship. But then again, if you take a ship and then have it rotating, have it, all of the uh, the vectors and everything get thrown off, by the time you've turned it's 90 blood. degrees, it's it's already <laughs> been wrecked. It's not seaworthy yeah. anymore. <laughs> it will get sunk pretty quick, huh? Yeah, I think so. So that's... Well, the the voxel farm stuff is a little bit cleaner. So, you you know it's i think that they they might be moving in that direction possibly but but as far as mounts and vehicles <clears throat> that is on the blueprint and that is after SOE live and they did talk about that wanting or or they are going to be adding mounts to the game for sure yeah which i don't know it's going to be hard for me to use a mount if it isn't faster than just flying with the belt of the zephyr grapple grappling across the ground you, you know i've tried them both and i think i actually move faster just flying with the messenger signet with the um um think then uh, grappling yeah really i if raced I'm, someone if i'm it, climbing it's a little bit different um trying to go up the grappler is definitely uncontested but just covering land space you know, a straight line is hard to beat, especially using that messenger signet and going into um, the speed flight mode, holding shift. That sounds like challenge, Nero. Well, we can uh, we I can handle my, that. I think my grappler could beat you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have a prime grappler like you. Do you have a Delver's grappler? You. Nope, not yet. Oh. I've requested one for my guild, <laughs> so I have a couple of spelunkers that are looking. <laughs> Yeah, Planet Explorers is player-made cars, tanks, ships, helicopters. Honestly, there, I I think in the past couple of weeks I've already played like three different, and Planet Explorers was one of them. Different games that have um, uh, custom vehicle build. Actually, Cube Gun was one that I played today. It's pretty limited, but that's all it is: is you're just putting cubes and guns together and then flying it out in this not quite voxel world. Um, there, there's all sorts of games like that out there, though, with the uh, the custom building and stuff. And I, I think that sort of stuff is starting to make a uh, uh, a return. Actually, the highly customizable uh, player made vehicles, because I remember there had been attempts at that sort of stuff in the uh, the 80s and the 90s, but it ended up being more limited sort of stuff. Like I think of the Mech Warrior series, it had a fair amount of customization, but you weren't like swapping parts between two different chassis or anything. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, NES, the Excite Bike had, uh, you could build your own track on it, right? Yeah. So they were like, they, they knew what they wanted to do way back then for sure. At least yeah, well, this games. is what I was suggesting, you know, months ago when I was saying I'd like to be able to build my own vehicles, you know? Yeah. The movement idea would be built into, you would attach that to things like engines or any gravity pods or wheels or whatever you know you would attach some sort of physics or behavior to certain items that you would add something to something like Gary's mod yeah exactly that you want it to do you know or yeah. look like you should say you know you build like if I want to go old school and build something inspired by like the Hawkman rocket cycle from Flash Gordon you know I just have to put inside of it and then make it look like I want it to look like you know that's what I'm hoping for eventually for sure Flash Gordon. That's I think that's an instant take a drink. 
Cheers. Cheers. Flash Gordon, my goodness. <laughs> what a hilarious movie. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I thought it was uh, quite an interesting piece for its time, given the other things made around that time. And I'm wondering what kind of weird stuff like that. That's actually, I think I actually brought that up for um, uh, Planet Side 2 years uh, last year. That that's what I want for an equivalent to the um, the Flash, the little ATV that you use for ground transport. Give us the the uh, the air scooter from Flash Gordon as as kind of the air equivalent. You're just you're pretty much using it to fly from point A to point B. You're gonna be real easy to shoot down, but you just jump out when you need to. Yeah, I know you've been lurking, Sog. With, <laughs> with the uh, with the with the you know genre neutrality of landmark. We could have uh, warthogs from Halo. We could have, you know, those uh, pod racers from Star Wars. We could have anything, really. You know, it's like, why not give it to us all? Let us make whatever we want to make. Exactly. So it's exciting. Now, I just wonder if it's going to be a um, a voxel only thing or a prop only thing or a combination of the two. Uh, I could yeah, maybe see them. A combination. I could see them designing a special form of voxel that's specifically used for the vehicles, and the way it's designed is that it's essentially textureless. It's a color, but it doesn't have a texture. So that way, you don't have to worry about the the texture. Mm -hmm. You know, moving essentially as the vehicle right. moves. Um, right. That or just an amalgamation of multiple props maybe they have snap points maybe they don't mm -hmm. i know yeah uh, i like that i think i think a snapping prop vehicle would make more sense than a voxel structure because moving voxels you're going to get that christmas light effect where it's do, 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 yeah. do, do, no matter what you can't avoid it right i i maybe. can't imagine how they can make it flow you know seamlessly through the <laughs> it just doesn't make sense in my mind I don't know if it, if you guys can figure it out. <laughs> Surf around the world and mimic boarding tricks. You know, Acidic, if they actually give us full body animations, uh, and that's something that I think the Evercast show, which they had their one-year anniversary recently, um, that was on Sunday, it was a good episode, um, they, they talked about the idea of full body animations, and I'm wondering if that's the sort of thing two, three later years down the road that we'll actually see the functionality to make like a Tony Hawk Pro Skater kind of game where it's um, loud, it's got the, the vehicle mechanics to it that you're on a skateboard and you can do different uh, grabs and different uh, grinds and you know all those different types of tricks and stuff but in the world of Landmark, in the context of Landmark and then you know once you're done with the uh, the designed um, uh, swimming pool area that you, you and your buddies have made just to test it then you go out and hit all sorts of other stuff Find Dave Georgeson's claim and go, you know, thrash around on it for a little bit. <laughs> go see what lovely thing Pentapod's been building, and then leave some, uh, leave some tire marks here and there. You know, that's I could see that being a, a hell of a lot of fun. That I would, I would play the hell out of. You know, that's that's I think the sort of thing that they want to be able to do with Landmark too is really be able to make it the the tool for anybody to be, make any sort of game with essentially. Yeah, some real good stuff there. So that's that's the the tech of EverQuest we're going to be looking forward to, and then the classes of EverQuest next. You'll get your answer about the Entertainer class finally, Adam. Finally, mm -hmm. finally, about it's, the. It's, it's, this will never be brought up. So. <laughs> I will bring it up. If if it's not brought up, I will totally be like, hey, what about an entertainer class? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're going to do it. Maybe a bard. I, I mean, bard is entertainer, right? By virtue. They're... Yeah, know. You know, but I, you know, I, again, I have a whole post up about it, so, you know. <laughs> uh, hey, Theodore, how you doing? Theodore is someone who's been uh, continuing to do the, um, uh, the Karen builds and Pretty awesome stuff going on over there. Definitely check it out if you're um, into that sort of thing. Actually, there's a lot of people. I, I I don't mean to pick out a few people. There's a lot of people who've got a lot of really cool Karen builds going on right now. Um, so if you are one of them, definitely you know put your put your name out there in chat and let everybody know. A jester. <sighs> 
but I could see a jester being uh you know basically a, a variation of a rogue honestly that you know they're they're using trickery and deception and um just doing it in a different way basically mm-hmm. or it it kind of makes me think of or um like the the drunken kung fu style that you're supposed to look like you're intoxicated and inebriated, but then when that punch comes, you just happen to be dodging out of the way and send one well, right to their upper lip. You're thinking in the context <laughs> of combat. I mean, do the classes have to be combat oriented and never quest? I next? suggest that with entertainer is, is it's not a combat thing per se. It would be a, I was postulating a buffing skill set that you know you start with basic performer. Hey, I can play a couple songs. And then you can advance into it and say become a dancer or perhaps you would be different entertainer skills. We could have a musician. You know, like obviously Bard is going to be a combat type thing. But I was thinking something in separate from combat that wasn't just about combat but was offering a, a buffing system um, that gave you know, interacting with the entertainer for say five minutes would give you the, them the ability to give you different types of buffs depending on what it was you were going to want to go do. You know that kind of a thing. Yeah. But you know, dancer, musician, juggler, um, um, ex- uh, not exotic dancer, but belly dancer. You know, like yeah. I, like that. I, I think are a great idea to kind of fluff up because again, I say it brings a whole new type of player to the game who normally wouldn't play a combat. Right. Well, well it, it it helps bring in a more social element for when you're not adventuring is where yeah. my logic is about that per se. When I think about that, I think of like Ogamar and like, there's always, you know, in World of Warcraft, I, because most people were there, in Ogamar and in Stormwind, there's always that social interaction. There's always, you see the same people around and it would be nice if there was classes where all they did was, you know, help maybe buff, like you said, buffed up the people in the main cities and, you know, send them off on their way to do their questing. They come back and then maybe they tip them or maybe they, you know, find, maybe they found a nice flute or something that no one else could use and then they would give it to that guy. So it'd be yeah, cool if, you know, people could participate and help uh, the other people, you know, just participate and be part of the community without having to directly do the rating in the combat. That is exactly what the entertainer class did in Star Wars Galaxies was, you know, it, your sole function, I mean, they added very late on the game like a combat entertainer but they were still very gimped in the sense of combat, but if you wanted to pull an entertainer through something give them a suit of armor and just say you know, hit your auto attack they would make it through, but the goal was the idea was it was a social class, you, know, you just hung out in the cantina and you waited for folks to come in and engage in. And yeah, it really, you're right. You see this kind of silliness in every MMO ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, World of Warcraft, I see it in T- you know, The Secret World. I see it in everything I've ever played, EverQuest 2. And yeah, there's nothing to stop you from standing on top of the mailbox and doing your basic dance. But <laughs> well, every I, 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 more than that, I don't, I don't think that it's not a... They shouldn't try they to stop should. us. They should promote it, right? Or they should exactly. develop the game around what we exactly. have decided to do. There to be a, a, a player interactive reason for for you to want to hang out and be that goofy, entertaining person. You know, exactly. So that's what I would like to see them. It's not just that I want to combat as a bard. You know, honestly, I have no interest in that. But what I like to be, you know, a mage, tank, wizard who in their spare time you know, belly dances? Yeah, I might be that guy. I really <laughs> that guy, you know. Would I most likely roll an alt then if like, you know, to always have a social class? Absolutely. You know, totally. It's the one thing I continue to pine for since Star Wars Galaxies went away is some sort of social class that really caters to that whole that whole idea. You know, I almost played my engineer as a social class in um, uh, World of Warcraft. My big thing was when I wasn't doing anything else, I'd hang out in the main city and be like, hey, I'll craft all your stuff, five gold or less, much cheaper for other things. My goal was A, to undercut the market and bring the the value of everything down to five gold or less. And uh, the other thing was 
I just like people having grenades to throw in PvP. If I'm, you know, supplying everybody with grenades, that's a stun effect, it's a damage effect. They're really effective in PvP. So and you're it was, that guy. It was a big you're PvP. the guy messing up the market. You know it. It's, that was me. <laughs> Which is probably why they didn't let me have Biznix Accuroscope, and that's why I quit the game. <laughs> it was, what I found was, and, and I, I know I've talked about it on the show before, but when I started playing Star Wars Galaxy, I was running a uh, system that really was not handling adventuring super well. And so I kind of decided to play an entertainer first and foremost, primarily because, well, I can just stand here. And do my thing, and the game will run fine. I'm not, you know, I'm inside a building; it all works perfectly. Um, but they gave me the opportunity to get to know the server, to get to know players gotcha. in the game. Who's asshat? Who's mm -hmm. cool? Who's helpful? Who's just generally a nice person? Who's a fucking weirdo role player who will never interact with you in a normal way? You know, like okay. You, learn those things as you're playing the game you know and by playing a class like that it, it does it just brings a whole other level of engagement and interactivity you know they keep talking about wanting it to be a sandbox game and for players to have tools to create the things they want this is a major element that needs to be in the game if you're okay gonna it this way you know? every every single fantasy game and probably even a lot of sci-fi games have done this exact same cliche at least once that at some point you have to go into some seedy bar and find someone who has information about people in town and you were that yeah. person so that's yeah. really really cool that you know through gameplay you basically became something that you know is almost an expected part of uh, a yeah. single player sort of experience now the other thing about entertainers not necessarily combat, but just everything they could be, you know, useful for. If there's a morale system, I could see that being the place where entertainers are, are really big. The um, uh, I had an anthropology class where uh, the class was originally uh, first and foremost was when you were playing galaxies, you got hit with different kinds of damage, but you would yeah. have a back fatigue that you would build up over time. So eventually, after several hours of playing you would have to go back to a cantina and watch an entertainer to remove the battle fatigue. Some people liked it, some people didn't. But it did create, you know, a reason to go back to them. And then again, like I said, you know, watching the musician, watching the entertainer gave you buffs to whatever certain stats they were, you know, designed to buff, you know? I gotcha. Yeah. So that's... I, I didn't mind that system too much. I liked it. It... it, it it was about First, like you know you go you go quest in for fifteen minutes and then you go back to the town and then you go hang out with people for you know five minutes and then you go do it again. It was a case of you could go play for several hours, but if you were getting to the point where your battle fatigue was really killing your region and you had the black you know damage on your health and your mind and all of that, it was the game's way of saying okay you are clearly running into a wall. It's time to take a break refocus and you get up and stretch like it was the game's way of forcing you to like reevaluate what you were doing you know and like i said it forced the players into social hubs and then forced a a social interaction like i said I, th I, I think that's that that this is kind of like the i think the difference maybe that needs to happen in the future where they did focus or force the players into those uh, cities or hubs but i would rather see where the players decide where they want to be, and then the game kind of uh, manipulates itself to to what they want to do. Not not necessarily like the it wouldn't be no. necessarily reactive to what the players are doing. But for instance, in EverQuest One, I was talking about this with my guild, uh, Colossus, where you know in EverQuest One you would sit in one spot and then you would have a puller in your group, and they would go out and find the mobs, and they would go pull the mobs all the way to the group. And yeah. then you would fight in one location. So it was kind of nice because you could just sit, hang out, chat. One person was going out like kind of hunting for mobs. And it was like you didn't have to keep moving and constantly, you know, adjusting your position and stuff where you could just kind of hang out and chat, ha have a good time. And I would love to see EverQuest Next kind of incorporate some of those features. Yeah, I would love to. Well, he, there's one. Though. What was that? We're also in a different age, though, where... yeah things that, you know, in Star Wars Galaxies in the early days, the focal point was Coruscant. You had to travel before there was your own private ships and stuff. You had to take public transportation. You had to travel through Coruscant. 
Um, eventually, when the game added your own personal starships and you being able to travel from wherever, Coruscant went from being, you need to buy something, you need your stuff sliced, you need spices, whatever you're looking for, just walk out of the starport of Coruscant, and there'd be a sea of people, you know, doctors buffing, the whole thing. It was, it was kind of awesome. When the ships came in, that all went away. There was, it became more difficult to find, well, where's Dr. Buffing? You know, and as the game went on, it became more about... And that was you, the jump of life, jump to light speed patch? Yeah, or yeah. Cause expansion? It, and it freed up the travel routes. You know, you could essentially... I was not a big space pilot guy, so once I had a ship and I was leveled, I would just use my starship to insta-travel from one port to another without worrying about... Sometimes I would hang out in space, but I would really just kind of bounce around. But... Like you're saying, you know, when the game creates elements that forces players together, there's a perk for it. You know, it's cool. But in this day and age, players don't want to have to stand around for 10 minutes and wait for the shuttle. Right. You know, I mean, look at it. We see it in World of Warcraft with, like, you know, the grouping. And, you know, it's all about I'm going to hit the button, get my thing, and get out. Like, you know, the, unfortunately, there's a lot of players who are not going to want to spend hours and hours and hours of downtime. For, I hope EverQuest yeah. Next isn't like that, to be honest. I hope you don't click a button and queue up for some instance or whatever. I hope it's more of a, you know, you're just in it. And I think Dave Georgeson really talked about that with the Zam interview with Lock Six Time, where he said, you know, this is, uh, EverQuest Next is going to be a lot different than any other game because it's not, it's a real virtual reality as opposed to, you know, here's your little avatar and you need to play the game that we set up for you. It's more of, he, uh, you know, you create your avatar and just do whatever you want. And there, I don't, I don't think, uh, I'm not sure if they talked about it, but I don't think there are any levels in EverQuest Next. Can you confirm that, Neuro? It's a, um, it's a thing that they've talked about somewhat. Um, it's like you, I kind of feel like uh, Final Fantasy Tactics is a better way to explain it. It's that you kind of level into a class, and then you can kind of ascend to higher levels in that class, or if you've got a different class that you've unlocked, you can then switch over to that and start working on building that up. But we'll actually get the final details, hopefully, uh, here at SOE Live. There was something else I wanted to bring up on the, the subject of entertainers, was I remember in an anthropology class that I had there, the Tobriand, uh, Tobriand uh, Island people, and they had this very interesting magic, and it worked for them. It was basically... Uh, singing their their traditional songs while they do all of their actions, and the reason why it worked is because it helped them pretty much s stay calm and stay focused on what they needed to be doing, so they wouldn't you know stray too far. They'd know where their group was at. They'd be able to uh, you know keep their spirits high, so they wouldn't you know be worried too much about distractions. So that worked for them. Anything they're doing, if you're trying to hunt something, if you're trying to you know build something, if you're trying to travel somewhere. Um, you know, they'd always be, you know, singing along. The only time they didn't is when they would be, um, I, I hate to call it hunting. It was basically harvesting this one type of fish that, uh, they would just go out into the ocean or into the, the, the nearby water, drop this bag of herbs that would pretty much dope the poor thing. And they could just pretty much grab it and take it with them. And because that was completely a non-dangerous venture, that was the only time they didn't do their, their musical thing. So I thought that was, you know, the idea that having something that's keeping the morale up or the, um, you know, the battle drummer in war that's basically keeping the pace and keeping the beat and being the one that's, you know, kind of auditorily driving the action for everybody, that, um, that definitely kind of ties in somewhat with entertainer but somewhat with like the entertainer class that travels with you a traveling minstrel a troubadour or whatever rather than somebody that's restricted to inns and taverns and yeah. you know Again, safer I want places to i want to make this clear because if you're going to be broaching this uh, concept uh, on my behalf when you're down there if it's not brought up I'm not talking about an entertainer skill set that's used in combat whatsoever right I'm completely talking about something that is a essentially a buffing class system that, that gives you an incentive to hang out and be social with other players, you know, in taverns, whatever, you know, where, wherever the main player hubs are. Um, I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, bring the bard with us, you know. To, <laughs> yeah, I'm not talking about that. 
I know there is going to be a bar, but I'm talking about something that would be, you know, more of a kind of a side thing. You know? Right, right. So, um, looking at the time, are you guys good to go for a little bit longer, or do you want to wrap it up here? Cause well, I'm, I'm, I'm able to go. Yeah, I mean, what else is there to chat about? You know? Oh, we still haven't finished, um, we haven't talked about what's going on on Saturday, actually. All right. So, I'm going to bring it up then, because that's the last well, thing for Friday. Go ahead. Well, before that, uh, the SOE Live Digital Pass 2014, which was $20, and that's for the uh, uh, SOE Twitch slash TV. So, I kind of just figured I would throw out, like, you get 11 emoticons, you get a chat badge, you get a uh, seven-day beta key exclusive uh, Planicide 2 gun, and then you get the exclusive h1z1 weapon which we were talking about in the pre-show and we're not sure like how they were going to implement that weapon the the mace like would you get it one time and then if you drop it it's gone or do you always yeah. get it or is it a pattern that only you can craft you know what what's the advantage of having that exclusive h1z1 item that's a good question <laughs> we don't know we talked about it earlier yeah, we, we talked about it. We don't know. So, um, But uh, another thing real quick is Avery Leonard uh, did a, uh, a forum post, or it was actually an article on how to entertain anyone who is a non-gamer uh, during the SOE live event. And that was kind of cool. He talked about, like, uh, you know, things to do in Planet Hollywood, Caesar Planet, uh, or, yeah, Caesar's Palace, excuse me, the Venetian, the New Yorker, or the New York, New York, um, a hotel and all that kind of stuff so I think that was a good article to check out and then also real quick um, they added a new guild recruitment subform so I'm gonna post that up real quick in chat cool dude. and if anyone is looking for a guild uh, you know or you have a guild that you want to start and you want to post it up uh, that's a good place to do it and like I mentioned earlier I'm in the guild Colossus so we have a lot of great people in here Temma, uh, Spooty Man uh, 80s in there, uh, Chip GM. I think he's in chat. I think I saw him a minute ago. He's yep. in there. So, a lot of great people in that guild. So, worth checking out for sure. Pretty cool. All right. So, rolling it back up here to Saturday. And oh, before Saturday, uh, mm -hmm. Friday, opening zombie prom and then. They're going to have the zombie pool party, mm -hmm. and then they're going to have the open, or uh, I guess open gaming, right? Yeah, they're going to, no, the open gaming, I think, Thursday, I don't know if it's Friday, too. I, I think it's Friday. It might just be Maybe Thursday. And there's also the uh, 10 ton hammer party at, I think, the pleasure pool from uh, 7 to 11.30. All right. So, um... Yeah, there's going to be a lot of events going on. Thursday from 9 to 11 p.m., I think I mentioned it earlier, at uh, Blondie's Sports Bar, there's going to be a little meet and greet with the uh, the live streamers, so that should be a lot of fun. And once again, anybody who didn't notice at the top of the screen there, we're going to be um, streaming from the SOE Live 2014 uh, steaming, uh, uh, or streaming team. Steaming team, <laughs> streaming team. <laughs> um, yeah, no thanks. Um, maybe when I'm sober. But that's uh, if you look at the top there. That's the uh, the little lo logo, little label rather that I've been uh, broadcasting under, and I will be there. I will be broadcasting at SOE Live from uh, I believe it's six to seven p.m. on Saturday on stage two. So that should be awesome. pretty cool. And who are you going to be with? I don't know. Um, I the 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 schedule had somebody listed, but they um, they they asked to have the schedule changed because they won't be uh, around by that point. So, not really a hundred percent sure who it's gonna be, but hmm. I'm I think it might be Chris. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, he's streaming all the time. That guy yeah, has he does. a huge following. So. Really good, good to know that guy. Yeah, well, I mean, he, he, doing it his job basically at this point. He's a he's a partner, isn't he? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. 
S- steaming trees, yes. <laughs> a metallical. Um, uh, real up? quick, uh, <laughs> one thing is, I kind of wanted to talk about things that are not listed on the blueprint, because okay. they're going to be they they already said they're going to be releasing a whole bunch of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, obviously, whatever they're going to be releasing isn't going to be on the blueprint. So I I made a little list, and I figured I would just kind of list some of the stuff. And if you have anything that is not in the blueprint or chat has anything, you know, type it out. And what's up, Metallica? I see he's uh, he just come out uh, come out to hang out in the chat. That's awesome. Yeah. Sorry. All right. So, anyways, with the uh, with the things not in blueprint, real quick, I'm just going to go through my list. Uh, Death is not on the blueprint. Dave G already confirmed on Twitter that that's pretty much coming uh, during SOE Live. Uh, combat's not on the blueprint. Mobs aren't on the blueprint. PVP's not on the blueprint. Story bricks aren't on the blu- blueprint. Weapons aren't on the blueprint. Uh, guild claims, like those 10x10 claims, those aren't on the blueprint. So those might be coming as well. Uh, and then also, I have a link here. And that just basically has, or that's the blueprint right there, and that has everything. Yeah, seven fifteen. So, that was the last update. So those were my like main primary things that could possibly be coming, and then also uh, another thing that they talked about like way early during alpha was uh, farming and growing crops in game. So yeah. that might be something that we could see during SO Live. Yeah, that would be pretty neat. For sure. All of that stuff, definitely. Um, pretty comprehensive list of things that aren't on the blueprint, actually. Yep. Uh, good stuff, good stuff. So let's uh, let's kind of continue down the list for what's going on on Saturday. And let's, I guess, have an accelerated pace because we do probably want to wrap it up before we hit the two-hour mark. So... The Islands of Landmark. Let's talk about all the procedural generated goodness in the world, find out how the pieces fit together, and give the team ideas and suggestions on how you think we could make them cooler and more interesting. Now, anybody who knows me knows that I love procedural games. I do a show every Saturday called Procedural Powerhouses. Haven't featured EverQuest Next, or rather, uh, Landmark yet, because, well, it's it's got the stuff, but it's not there yet. It's not like you know the the game that everybody wants to play quite yet it's still just the building and the the most that you'll see with the procedural generation the world design it's awesome technically it's awesome but it's something that's really easy for people to overlook and the same thing with the caves technically they are an amazing feat they are really really awesome but for somebody that isn't necessarily looking at things at that angle it's you know it's a feature it's a hole in the ground right yeah. <laughs> it's, you know that's what they see but when Terry Michaels looks at it, he's like, wow, we just created, like, you know, art. <laughs> I mean, when when I see it, thinking about um, Darren McPherson absolutely loving Terraria, and, you know, he's the, I think, the lead? Lead combat designer. Right? Yeah. Yeah. He's, um, that, that gives me hope for what kind of stuff we're going to see going into those caves. Um, I would say, just real quick, the evolution of 2D sandbox games and how they work from Terraria on. Terraria, you only had front wall and you could just dig anywhere in the world and randomly find resources. But as you get to more advanced games like Kriya and Edge of Space, those not only have front wall, they also have the back wall. So if you've got, you know, you might have a bunch of iron that you can collect off of the the main walls that are actually stopping you as boundaries, but the background wall behind that, you can also collect the, uh, the iron ore off of that too. So, you know, that kind of evolution, and then all of them, you know, all the games have, as you go deeper, there's different stuff, different biomes, different uh, types of threats, but always as you go deeper, it gets tougher and tougher and tougher. And with Kree, it's Definitely. not just deeper, but as you get farther away from where you start at the very beginning of the game, everything gets tougher. In that game, there's actually mobs that will contest each other for territory and try to spread around. So that's almost like a a light version of what's going on with Story Bricks. So honestly, there's a lot of what we see in the 2D sandboxes that I'd say really serves as a prototype for what we're going to be seeing in Landmark and EverQuest next in the the coming months here. So 
Um, if that's something that you folks are interested in, uh, Terraria, Crea, uh, Edge of Space, uh, Starbound, there's a lot of 2D sandboxes out there, and they're um, a really good way to learn about this sort of stuff. And, and kind of what really inspired them. They didn't base it on Terraria. Terraria hit Steam after EverQuest Next started development, but as soon as Darren McPherson saw it, he's like, oh my god, this is exactly what we're looking to do, but it's like a 2D prototype. And whenever he had to explain an idea for something to somebody, he would just load up Terraria, show them in-game, and be like, that, but I want that in 3D. Mm. And that's totally awesome to me. I'm really, really excited to see the uh, the islands of Landmark and kind of learn about how that's going to affect future systems, the static water, dynamic water, um, um, combat, world-changing events. You kill uh, such and such creature, the entire biome in that area gets nuked to the to the lava storm uh, biome, that sort of stuff. I'm really, really, really excited to see. Yeah, I, I look. I look forward to getting a, a taste of that stuff too. Then, um, two to three p.m. Uh, combat and landmark, whatever. Who even cares about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That is going to yeah, be man. a ghost town. There is nobody going to be at that panel. <laughs> you're going to, you know, there's, you're going to find more people just chatting in the hallways being like, man, is that a combat landmark town? <laughs> I think they're going to have to reserve one of the big rooms for that one. That's going to oh, be yeah. huge. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be huge. Take Lyria. Yeah, it's... I. <laughs> I definitely am probably going to have to leave the previous panel that I'm at early to to save a seat because or just you know sit down on the panel before it because that one's going to be absolutely packed. It's going to be packed and it's not on the um, the live stream schedule, so it's going to be up to us to record that and bring that knowledge back uh, one for really? one. Really, that's not going to be on the live stream. The nope. combat. No. Nope. Wow. That yeah. Is interesting. There's got to be like an H1Z1 thing or something going on at that time. Hmm. Oh, well. <laughs> I'm counting on you, Nero, to give me the info because I'm not going to be there, unfortunately. I bet I'm not going to be the only one filming it either. I think everybody's going to have a bunch of cameras this year. Um, then 4 to 5 p.m., Landmark Wiki on Gamepedia, a live interactive tutorial. Join the team from Curse slash Gamepedia for this overview of Landmark Wiki, which is an interesting thing. Yes, the wiki is a good thing to have. It's good for the game. It's good for the community. But at the same time, the entire point of what SOE has been doing with the game is trying to design it that you don't have to go outside of the game to learn about it, to know about it, to understand more about it. So it creates this weird, like... You know, if you prefer one, you have it available, but we really want you to, you know, be learning it from the stuff in the game and the tutorials we have available there. So you don't just have to go off and, you know, find the information elsewhere. Yeah, it seems like they're not, like, limiting themselves, to, you know, from any aspect of that gamers would usually use as a resource to find information. But yeah, I agree with, like, I don't use a wiki. I don't want to use a wiki. I don't want to have to leave my game. I don't want to I don't want to have to look at a website to figure out how to craft something. That's for sure. Or the worst, an in-game browser that brings up the wiki. Ugh. Ugh. That's the worst. That's the worst. Uh, a couple games did it. <laughs> and they're really just laggy. And for some reason, in-game browsers never work. I don't know why, but they're always slow. Web browsers, even Internet Explorer, are all an optimized web browser. You can't just drag and drop that functionality into a game client and expect positive results. Yeah. <laughs> you know, There's a delay. There's like a three-second delay across the board. That kind of stuff. Because the game not only has to render all of the stuff and handle all of the, the security and in-out stuff that's already going on, but now you've got websites, and there's probably also eyes on the thing to make sure, you know, if somehow you've accessed inappropriate material, the game is doing something to, you know, try to keep you from it, or you know, one way or another. So, yeah, no, wiki, you know, for people that like wikis, it'll be great. And then uh, the last thing um, for landmark before we get to the the last stuff on the schedule for EverQuest next, uh, Sunday, 
is the landmark Q&A that is just you know open floor for for the 50 minutes or the hour or whatever to ask questions and my one worry is that they're not going to have good enough filtering of questions because almost every Q&A panel I've been to whether it's professional political it's already known information otherwise, right no it's that people come up to ask a question but then spend 5 to 10 minutes delivering a statement that isn't actually a question at all and they just waste everyone's time and mm -hmm. all the speaker can do afterwards is say, uh-huh, next. Yeah. You know, so that's that's the thing I really hope they, they'll have some way to curtail and allow us to, um, you know, <laughs> actually ask questions and actually, you know, have, have things that we really want to know that they haven't already beaten into the ground that we don't already know after having been through SOE Live, but that it's really for all the, the you just little want a questions. Good, you just want a screener. <laughs> you know, well, someone yeah. screen the, the retards. <laughs> Let's be honest. Get rid of the retards. Let's get some good questions so we can actually get some good information. Yeah, Ray, if Microsoft would disagree with me, I think they don't believe Internet Explorer is a functional device, and that's why they preload everybody with it. I think you're right. <laughs> All right, and now um, if Omid was here, he'd probably make a uh, a dig against Windows phones, which <laughs> I've never used one myself, but I hear from him they're really bad. Couldn't be any worse than a BlackBerry. True. <laughs> so I heard I hear the Galaxy is the way to go, right now, anyways. A lot of people have uh, been really happy with their Galaxies, but anyway. So the last thing on the schedules, uh, we, we finished up with Landmark, so EverQuest next, Saturday. They don't have anything Sunday. Set, uh, Saturday is the last thing, and that's from 11 a.m. to noon, the content of EverQuest next. Learn more about the team, uh, about how the team is working with Storybricks to create content in ways that will make your head spin. I mean, that will make the world of Norath come alive in EverQuest next. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> it's gonna be a big one. Once again, hmm. packed audience expected. Get there early, <laughs> and bring a notepad or a camera or both because it's gonna be a lot of information. So, Nora, did you, have you seen any of Storybricks presentations in the past? Uh, only the one from the AI conference in Vienna, which basically told me enough that I understand the sorts of things that we'll be able to do and it's really really powerful I mean I, I don't know how much they're gonna give us control over it and what kind of things we'll be able to do but we might be able to just you know straight up label some person that we know as the the greatest villain ever for some story in some quest or whatever and so players are spending all of their time and effort trying to track down smoke jumper and be like hey you're you're the such and such villain i need to duel you to complete this quest and restore the honor to the house of such and such and of course dave georgian being a you know developer would be like oh i will gladly apply to you slash god mode on let's do this <laughs> <laughs> and he, he he transforms into a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Instant raid boss. <laughs> like All right. So uh, I think that's about it. Before we start getting into the wrap up process, was there anything else either you guys wanted to say? Um, no, I think. Uh, oh, I know. Will somebody please, pretty please, when Chagrin's up, buy me a loot card while you're there and ask for yeah, I'm Thank sure. I'm sure that can be figured out. <laughs> Somebody figure out and make that happen, please. Thank you. I'm jealous. I wish I was going. I'm, uh, you know, like I said, I'll be uh, tuning into the live streams. That's for sure. Yeah, and I would wager during the live streams they're probably going to do random giveaways, so people might be able to win the the cards that way too. That'd be nice. Hey, there you go. That's an idea. That's a great idea. If you can, yeah. If you Swing well, it, I'm not sure if it would be me, but definitely, um, you know, SOE, I'm sure they're going to be doing some sort of giveaways and stuff during the live streams. That's what they do. 
store. Yeah, you never know. I would I would I would be surprised if they didn't give away extra ones and stuff. <clears throat> yep. All right. So that is. Oh wait, 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 wait! Oh, I got wait, one more thing. What you got? You ready for this? Yeah. If you guys haven't checked out Morpheus, Morpheus is the next generation of virtual reality for Sony, and they're developing it for the PlayStation. And they originally were talking about a lot about Morpheus, uh, uh, about the what's the other Oculus um, Rift, Oculus, Oculus Rift, and using it with Landmark. But then they haven't been talking about it. And I'm pretty sure that's because Morpheus is coming out, and that's going to be their new virtu Sony's virtual reality system. So that's, I think, something worth looking well, into. And it might be something they talk about at SOE Live. Maybe. I'm sure it'll be supported, but right now, you know, even Oculus Rift is still uh, in the development process. It's not even a consumer ready device. So, uh, yeah, last time I saw them even remotely teasing that, they were showing one of the developers working. Uh, with an Oculus Rift on at his workstation, so um, I yeah I think virtual headsets and the 3D immersion thing is very much going to be a major part of our future over the next few years for sure. And I'm oh sure yeah, we'll oh yeah. It, it just just based on uh, uh, Dave's interview on Zam, he talked a lot about a, a virtual reality specifically, <laughs> and I don't think that was you know, a mistake that he was talking about that. I think they're going to start encompassing landmark and everquest more into that realm of encompass or you know giving everyone a place to participate in the game you know you don't have to be a max level raider or you don't have to be this specific you know type combat class you can everyone can participate and find a role and i think you're kind of seeing that in landmark already with you know where we we have people who spelunk we have people who just gather resources or maybe they just do uh you know, uh, floral design or that kind of thing. Very specific, unique things, but everyone can kind of do what they want to do. And that's more of the virtual reality environment that Dave G's was talking about, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, there's there's so much to virtual reality, though. Like, once we've got the visual down, then maybe the smell-o-vision technology that exists will start <laughs> being improved. Because I tried smell-o-visions at... Um, uh, SIGGRAPH 2008 and then again at SIGGRAPH 2010 and mm -hmm. they were very 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 limited I mean it's a really tough science because you know you can't just it, it's not so like many, colors uh, well, different pores in your in your nose right the it's, receptors it's a combination of that and it's limited sets of chemicals to produce the smells you can't just you know you can't mix red and blue and it, get right? you know well, let's uh, face smell is not that immersive an element to add to a game Compared to 3D or surround sound, you know. I don't know, dude. If it stank like a zombie survival game when I was playing H1Z1, maybe I'd be a little bit more fearful. <laughs> There's a level of reality I don't need. And smell. Right yeah, I don't need smell either. I'm gonna be. I don't agree with you on that one, Adam. <laughs> don't, don't I don't need taste. Smell. I don't need smell. And but you, you can't like just have your shot. character eat the moldy bread. You have to taste the moldy uh, bread. Taste the moldy bread. Well, I've seen like in Japan they have like shock uh, systems where you're hooked up wherever you get shot. You actually like get shocked in that mm -hmm. part of your body and stuff. So like it gets, it's really uh, hardcore with the immersion and the virtual reality aspect of it. But Ooh. I think it's cool. Yeah. I've tried one of those things, by the way, just the uh, the arm unit. There was also a SIGGRAPH 2010. And they had a simulation of ants running on your arm and then cockroaches running on your arm. And yeah, yeah. It, it mostly just felt like teeny little electrodes poking me every here and there. But, yeah, yeah. so let's, uh, let's wrap it up here lest we go over the two-hour limit because now yeah. the, uh, the VOD system and everything, you definitely have to highlight everything or it gets deleted. Twitch users, by the way, definitely learn and understand the VOD system. If you don't cut a highlight within a few days, your video just up and disappears. Mm. Um, so definitely be wary of that sort of thing. So, this has been Live Feature Rant. This is the last episode before SOE Live, and then, you know, starting next week will be the... Well, it'll still be Live Feature Rant, and I might have a new uh, new interface up, but... Um, with SOE Live's knowledge in mind, we're going to have a lot to talk about. It is going to be nuts. So on that note, I'm going to uh, get us into our final wrap-ups here. You all know me, of course, Legendary Neurotoxin. 
course, doing live feature rant. This show here, dead feature rant when I can. Um, castles and crap shacks when I can. Procedural powerhouses when I can. And I say that because I'm not going to be doing any of those this week. I'm going to be at SOE Live. Um, Unity Daily is on hiatus. Steam Daily has been going pretty well. And I have recently started with this Who's Gaming Now group. And they've actually got this thing called... Um, Flying Bundle. If you go to flyingbundle.com, that's the the first bundle that they've set up. There will be many more to come, and I actually played all of those games early on my channel. So if you want to check those out and see what they're all about, the the links are there. You just have to go and find them. So, Adam, why don't you uh, kind of talk about what you've been up to and what you've got coming up? Yeah, you know, just uh, check out my YouTube channel. It's uh, YouTube.com/at0mxii. Uh, same as Twitter. And you can get me up there and find all my geeky content going on there. Cool deal. Cool deal. And of course, uh, if anybody missed it earlier, the uh, the dissertation on Babylon 5, there is going to be some Babylon 5 hype going on Adam's channel, so definitely if that's a show that you've ever been entertained by, interested in, loved it, um, hated it, but wanted it to be something different, and now there's going to be a reboot coming, you know, Keep an eye on that stuff. Going to be some uh, some some interesting stuff coming along there. And Cody, why don't you uh, why don't you kind of talk about what what's going on with you and what you've been up to? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I will, I recently joined the Colossus Guild, so that's in Landmark. Check them out, Colossus. Um, and I'm basically you know we're we're community trying to build EverQuest. <laughs> you know, at its core, you know, we are all the people in there are for EverQuest one lovers. And we all have a good attitude, and we all really feel that you know we can bring the awesome moments that we had in EverQuest to the actual game that they're going to be building or that we're going to be building. So that's kind of what I've been up to, uh, just working with Colossus people, hanging out, and uh, building an EverQuest. I've been working on the Landmark Karen uh, competition, building a bridge, and doing some other. Uh, YouTube videos on my YouTube channel, which is uh, YouTube slash NanoVoxel. So check that out. I'm going to post the link real quick. Absolutely. And there, there you can see how to build some basic uh, Karen structures. And they were actually fe uh, featured by Sony, which was really cool of them. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Okie dokie. So that is the end of the show. And we are going to do a raid. We are going to head over to Sog's channel. You all saw him in chat earlier and he's actually uh he was he was looking to kind of string things along here that after live feature and if you still haven't heard enough about what's going on at SOE Live and you're real real hyped and of course he's also gonna be building in game I'm pretty sure. So uh yeah or you know at least doing something. So that's definitely where you want to go after there. I put the link in chat and I will see you folks there. But this is the end of the show so Thank you very much, everybody, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.